Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. This presentation is just to go over quickly a PDF of a paper that was published in 2011 and it was submitted uh, August the 20th, 2011 by one Alexander Parkamov. And it's a paper talking about the deviations from beta radioactivity exponential drop. And this is a paper that was published to talk about a wide-scale, multi-year experiment conducted by Alexander uh, across a number of radionuclides, uh, where he established that there is patterns uh, for the variation in the rate of decay of beta decay isotopes. And this is uh, relevant to his book, Space Earth Human, which we are proposing to do a translation of in a social fundraising campaign. So I'm just going to go over a couple of quick points uh, in here. Essentially, he did a whole range of different elements, uh, tritium, 56 manganese, uh, 32 silicon, 36 chlorine, 60 cobalt, 137 cesium, 90 strontium, uh, and also uh, decay products of 226 radium and saw rhythmic changes of amplitude between 0.1% and 0.3% from average magnitude and period one year and up to 0.01% with period of about one month uh, and this is uh, incredibly uh, interesting to me uh, one point I had a uh, a guy from a physics department at a university telling me that this is absolutely impossible to uh, even consider and uh, uh, it just wouldn't occur. And so anyway, um, I'm just going to go quickly over it and you can read the paper for which I will give a link in the bottom of this video. Uh, essentially, here's a, a wide range of studies conducted uh, over uh, large periods of time and what he does say is that alpha particle uh, decays don't seem to have any real change but uh, beta and double beta decays appear to have some uh, variance. One of the key findings was the month high low values. Um, the highest was in 1, 2, 3 uh, i.e. January, February, March and uh, uh, the low values were July, August and September. And you can see this data here, uh, which is in the 2010 Russian edition of his book, Space Earth Human, and for which he will be updating with latest data. But you can see that the data collection of his experiment started in, I think it was 1998, and... Uh, has continued, as far as I'm aware, to this day. And in this paper, he does suggest that, uh, if I go down to the bottom here, or gives credit to the first person to report this, was uh, Barov uh, in the uh, a Russian paper, uh, and it was in 2000. It's only in Russian. I've tried to find it. I have not been able to find that. Perhaps I can get a copy from him. Which is interesting, and this is typical of Alexander Parkhamov giving credit to someone else when he's actually also been doing the research himself. So let's go back. Uh, so what you see here is that as we approach sort of January, February, March, each year the count rate goes up, and as we approach sort of July, August, September each year, the count rate goes down. And this is true in these uh, table of data for for 60 cobalt. Uh, this is uh, two different types of de detector looking at 90 strontium. But he does discuss in the paper how uh, 239 plutonium, uh, which is an alpha emitter, doesn't really have anything more than just statistical variation, um, uh, Poisson distribution variation over uh, the period. So um, uh, now he also talks here about the uh, uh, lunar um, phase, the, the, the new moon. So we've got a new moon here where you've got a higher count rate and uh, the full moon here and here where you've got a lower count rate. Now, in the case of this data, uh, this is uh, uh, over um, 
a very number, large number of years. So we've got 1998 through to uh, 2010. Um, and this average data here is uh, between April 2000 and March 2007. So this is the average pattern uh, taken for the uh, 90 strontium, 90 yttrium uh, over 87 cycles of new moon, full moon. And this is very interesting to me. Uh, there is data just recently out from a Chinese group. Uh, I'll also include the link to that work in the uh, description of the video, where they have found some uh, cat catalytical chemistry uh, that has taken potassium to calcium. That's adding a proton into the uh, potassium. And uh, this is something that Kevran in the 1950s uh, looked at with uh, the uh, seed germination and, and uh, shells of uh, chicken eggs and uh, has had its ups and downs. But there was a study, actually I talked about this study uh, with Alexander Parkhamov. And he says, oh yeah, well, <laughs> uh, he seemed to sort of not be surprised. But it was uh, the study of seed germination, say with mung beans, has been shown uh, to not work with certain uh, uh, replications. However, I think in I think it was 2013. We've discussed this on our uh, Facebook before. Uh, there was a uh, Indian study, and what they did is they planted seeds uh, over with a sort of couple of days or a number of days uh, gap. And what they found was that uh, there was at certain phases of the moon, uh, and consistently, or seemingly consistently, uh, there was uh, higher concentrations of transmuted elements in the dry ash uh, over and above the seeds to the actual germinated uh, bean uh, shoots, uh, uh, you know, respective to whether it was a full or, or a new moon. So... Uh, there's an in interesting potential correlation there. And I have to ask, you know, where um, different cultures, uh, having lived in India for so many years and uh, with, with my staff there, you know, choosing to do things on auspicious days or to carry out certain ceremonies, you know, for instance, harvesting or, or planting things at, uh, at certain times of year, um, it, is there more to... Uh, the knowledge that's codified in ancient texts and understandings um, than just uh, <laughs> the fact that, oh, there's a lot of rain or whatever. You know, the auspicious days aren't always necessarily so obvious. And these ancient cultures seem to know these things. But anyway, what we're getting here is a variance, it would seem, in uh, the beta uh, decay of 90 strontium. Uh, over a period of seven years, but with the lunar cycles. And at this, uh, you know, when when you talk about the neutrino streams uh, uh, that uh, Parkhamov has in the book that we're proposing to translate, um, and how the sun, earth, and moon uh, uh, interact uh, gravitationally, and the fact that... Uh, uh, neutrinos are not charged, but they do interact uh, uh, with gravity. Uh, so they can be influenced by gravity. Now, uh, the, the other thing that he found was that there was no real uh, variation in diurnal variation, that is through the day and the night, that couldn't be explained by the uh, variance in the measuring equipment due to temperatures uh, caused by the uh, temperature change between day and night. So I'm, I'm just going to, you can read this in your own time. I, I want to make this a short video, but I want to come down to, he was saying in the discussion, let us consider how discovered properties of this phenomena square with hypothesis put forward as an explanation for deviation from purely exponential character or radioactive decay. I'm going to skip straight to number two. It says, a reasonable exp explanation for the fact that the effect under discussion occurs in beta decays uh, uh, only is to assume that it is caused by an incoming flux of cosmic neutrinos. Since these particles are involved in the process of beta decay, but do not take part in alpha decay processes or in, take part in alpha decays. The hypothesis that new, the neutrino flux is produced by the sun 
and that the annual changes in radioactivity are associated with variations in the flux density as a result of changing distance between the Sun and the Earth due to orbital motion of our planet was proposed by Falkenberg 5 and reproduced by Jenkins and Fishback 14 and 18. This assumption looks very unconvincing due to the extremely weak interactions with matter of solar neutrinos with energies of about one mega electron volt and higher. This elusive nature of neutrinos was confirmed by many experiments. If one takes that for some reason interaction of solar neutrinos with radionuclides is significantly stronger than suggested by currently accepted estimates, then their flux intense, uh, density would experience noticeable attenuation due to passing through the body of the Earth and result in lower rates of radioactive decay at night when compared to the midday values. Experiments reveal no such changes. In addition, this hypothesis is not able to explain the existence of readily discernible variations with the period of the synodical lunar month with maximums around new moons and minimums around full moons. So he's essentially saying, basically, if it really was due to the variance between summer and winter of the uh, 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 location of the Earth respective to the uh, sun, uh, then uh, you would uh, uh, see changes between day and night, which you don't see. But uh, uh, you do see changes with the moon. Another hypothesis proposes that periodic changes in beta radioactivity are a manifestation of fluxes of relic neutrinos, more precisely of one of the components of dark matter, slow neutrinos, with a velocity of 10 to 1,000 kilometers per second. And there's uh, four references given for that. This assumption is in agreement with the significantly lower magnitude of diurnal oscillations as compared with the oscillations of, with an annual rhythm, as shown in 20. The strength of the effect depends strongly on the velocity of motion relative to the flux of slow neutrinos. Throughout the year, due to the orbital motion of the Earth, its speed relative to galactic neutrinos changes by 40 kilometers per second, whereas the speed changes caused by the spinning of the Earth around its, ax its axis do not exceed one kilometer per second. The appearance of the rhythm of synodic, uh, syndic lunar months, about 29.5 days, could be explained by the fact that the gravitational field in the system Earth, Moon, Sun changes with this period. Gravitational field is the main factor affecting the motion of fluxes of slow neutrinos. Moreover, the assumption of the influence exerted by cosmic fluxes of slow neutrinos on beta radioactivity explains bursts of the radioactivity of beta sources uh, mounted in the focal point of a parabolic mirror. And uh, if you look around on our site, you can see the video that I took of his apparatus that was used to uh, attain and gather some of this data or the kind of apparatus that was used. The last thing I want to draw your attention to is his conclusion, and this is bearing in mind this is a conclusion based on, you know, a long period of study of this uh, uh, put forward in August of 2011, uh, but also given credit to the same observations or similar observations uh, published in 2000. In this paper, the review of experimental results indicating presence of rhythm and sporadic changes at measurements uh, of beta radioactivity is given. Nearly identical effects on eight different beta radionuclides with half-lives from 2.6 hours to 3 times 10 to the 5 years with the use of very different detectors, scintillators, proportional counters, Geiger-Muller counters, ionization chambers are obtained in Germany, Russia and USA. The fact that the effect observed only for beta and not alpha radioactivity allows to assume that it is caused by an incoming flux of cosmic neutrinos, maybe relic neutrino flux. Importance of this effect that it indicates a possibility of influence on radioactivity. And if we shall learn to operate radioactive decay rates over a wide range, it will be possible to create, in essence, new nuclear power engineering. So he's saying here, 
based on his research from 1998 onwards and uh, supported by the report in 2000 by Baurov et al. And published in August or, or made available for publishing in August 2011. He is saying that this slow neutrino flux, if we can create something that creates st slow neutrinos in situ, and that this has the ability to modify the decay rates of radionuclides, uh, principally uh, beta emitters, it will be possible to create a new energy technology, a new nuclear energy technology. So I hope this gives you a little bit of insight. Uh, this is not something that uh, Alexander Parkhamov came up with recently. Uh, this is understanding that guides his research and might explain why uh, he has had uh, a little bit more success than the average replicator out there in recent years. So thank you for your time. I will include also another paper in here uh, which also talks about a low momentum or slow neutrinos. Uh, so there'll be three papers in the description of this video. And I will encourage you uh, to read those and also consider the cross correlations. Please, if you are interested in Lena, it would be really great to have your support in funding this translation. Thank you very, very much. See you soon.